we were very modern at the end of the last lecture, and now we go back, well, at least 30 years, almost, yeah, 35 years or so, right? To the very beginnings um, of the discovery of strong field effects, the discovery of above threshold ionization. Um, and we do this because uh, this is kind of the, um, this is kind of the, uh, this sets the stage to, some, uh, to the next chapter, yeah, where we will talk about interference uh, effects. Um, and in order to, yeah, in order to learn to know uh, the effects um, that can be explained by interference, but they can also be uh, interpreted uh, in the photon picture. Um, we uh, look at, uh, at this topic here. Yeah? So ATI peaks and ponderomotive effects. Yeah? So what happens to, uh, the, to above threshold ionization spectra because, uh, due to the, um, to the effects of, uh, of the ponderomotive energy or the ponderomotive potential? Yeah? So, um, well, um, you all have this picture in mind where we have an atom in its ground state, something like this here. We have the ionization threshold, right? And above that, the continuum. And we said that we need um, a series of photons in order to get to the continuum and perhaps even beyond, yeah, such that we produce this series of ATI peaks. Yeah, so this ionization threshold um, so far, well, it is a property of the atom. Yeah? But now if you think about um, the situation yeah, in, in a little bit more detail, then you would say, well, if there is an, uh, if I produce such an electron um, in the continuum, then this electron in the continuum will be a free electron. Yeah, so if I want to put an electron in the continuum and there's still the laser, then this electron must have the quiver energy, must have the ponderomotive energy, which implies that in order to, um, to ionize an electron, I not only need um, to supply the ionization energy, but also the ponderomotive energy. Right? Okay, let's write that down. Yeah? So the first point is in order to excite an electron from the ground state G. to the continuum, um, the electron or uh, the atom, yeah, so I perhaps so I should say it, the atom needs to take up the ionization energy. Energy um, EIP. Yeah? But since um, the electron is free in the continuum, it will quiver there with kinetic energy with a kinetic energy 
um, equal to the ponderal motive energy. Yeah, and therefore, the atom needs to take up EIP plus UP. So, and the consequence is um, with increasing intensity, so with increasing ponderomotive energy, the ATI peaks should shift to lower energies, to the red. Yeah, so we call it a red shift. Yeah? So um, the ATI peaks should shift to lower energies as um, the intensity and thus UP is increased. Well, can this be seen? Let's have a look. Yeah, so here's a publication by Pierre Augustini, still a young man at that time. Uh, yeah, so the, the man who discovered uh, ATI yeah, um, almost 10 years before. And uh, you see, uh, you see what uh, what one would what one would expect, right? So that these peaks um, that they shift with laser intensity, right? And here is the line of what would uh, would be expected. Uh, and apparently, they changed uh, the they changed the the intensity by by shortening the pulse. Yeah? Okay, good. So this has been done. Um, however, there's an effect that counteracts this thing here. Yeah? Uh, namely the following thing. Um, so if you look at an, um, at an laser focus, yeah, so a laser focus like this one here, yeah, so a cross-section of a laser focus. Yeah, so, oh, uh, I wrote here T, this is wrong. What I wanted to write here is X. Yeah, so this is a cross-section through a laser focus. And this is the intensity as a function of x. Yeah? So this means that the ponderomotive energy here is higher than it is here. Right? So the ponderomotive energy also follows this curve. And now if we take the derivative of the ponderomotive energy, then we get what? We get a force. Yeah? So this means that an electron that sits here yeah, um, feels a force and will be accelerated out of the focus. Yeah? What if it's in the exact center? Of, uh, uh, what if it's in the exact center? Yeah, of course, then there's nothing. Yeah? So then it doesn't see a force. Yeah? But uh, the exact center is just a mathematical thing. Yeah? Um, so the density of, uh, or the number of, elect uh, of, of atoms will be zero there. <laughs> um, so in any case, what you see is that an electron that sits here yeah, 
um, yeah, so an electron that sits here um, has a certain pondromotive energy, has the pondromotive energy that corresponds to this local intensity here. And accordingly, the ionization threshold is higher, or the effective ionization threshold is higher, um, according to the pondromotive energy that corresponds to this intensity here. Right? So the electron is redshifted initially. But then it can accelerate, yeah, roll down this hill, so to say, and regain this pondromotive energy. Yeah? So um, if the electron does this here, then the peaks shouldn't be shifted. Yeah? OK. Well, let's write that down. So, um, we call this x0. Yeah, so, an electron or an atom, let's say an atom ionized at um, an offset at uh, an offset x0 from the center of the focus um, will need an ionization energy of um, EIP plus UP at this position x0, right? Yeah. This means the ATI peaks will shift to lower energies or yeah will shift to lower energies yeah, and the shift is the shift is up of x0, right? So now the point is, however, yeah, um, there is a gradient, is a gradient and thus a force um, on the photoelectron. There's a gradient of UP and thus a force on the electron um, on the electron in the focus. Yeah. And um, yeah, this means the electron will gain an energy of UP of X0, right? And this means um, the ATI peak shifts back, right? Shifts back to its original position. Original position given by 
n times h bar omega minus e i p. Well, how can we observe this, this uh, redshift? Yeah, so there, uh, back at that time, there was, uh, so still in the beginning of the, uh, of the 90s, um, the there was a dispute in the community whether this, uh, this ponderomotive shift is, is real, right? Uh, I can't quite understand why there was a question about that because uh, if you follow my line of arguments, it's, it's as clear as it can be. Yeah, so the electron, of course, needs to be given uh, the ionization energy, but then if it is in the continuum and has to quiver there, it also needs to be provided with this energy. Right? But nevertheless, uh, people, um, dis so it was disputed at that time. Um, and of course, it didn't help uh, that one has these two counter, uh, counter acting uh, effects yeah, that push the ADI peaks to, the, to their original um, uh, position. So how could one, what kind of experiment could one do uh, in order to, well, in order to, to avoid this effect of the electron rolling down, so to say, the ponderomotive potential? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If you use a pulse that is short enough, if you use a pulse uh, that is short enough, just uh, that the pulse is over before the electron gains energy. Yeah. So a short pulse can be used in order to uh, in order to make the decision. And of course, you can uh, easily calculate. Um, you can easily calculate. Um, how long the how short the pulse should be, right? And if you're in the femtosecond, uh, so below 100 femtoseconds or so, you are uh, you are safe. Yeah? So for the intensities we are considering. Um, yeah. So um, the effect of um, of yeah, gaining kinetic energy in the focus uh, due to um, the gradient of the ponderomotive potential. can be avoided with short pulses. Now it's an easy exercise to estimate how short the pulses uh, should be with short pulses. Yeah, so um, definitely for 100 femtoseconds, we are in, in a safe regime. Um, yeah. So with short pulses, yeah, so even with these 50 picoseconds, it was uh, already possible to see uh, the shifting, the shifting ATI peaks. Okay, so uh, people use shorter pulses. Yeah, so uh, of course, not because of this reason, just because the technology uh, developed such that shorter and shorter pulses were available. Uh, and then people started to discover additional things. Yeah? So, and uh, one of the effects would be, would be pulse broadening. Yeah? So we suppress now uh, the fact, uh, or ATI uh, peak broadening. So we now uh, suppress um, this um, thing of gaining kinetic energy in the focus. Um, then of course we still have a focus. Yeah? So let me depict one. Yeah, so uh, we have a focus like this, right? And now you see that we have um, 
that uh, we have electrons that are created uh, pretty much in the center of the focus, say here, right? Um, of course, the intensity is highest, and per cubic centimeter, um, a lot of ionization will take place. But actually, at this intensity, say, uh, in this red shaded area, yeah, if, the in, uh, if the intensity is there also um, high enough to ionize at least, say, with a tenth of that probability in the very center, um, then you still have a lot of signal from here because the volume here is much higher, right? So this is the volume effect. Um, but of course, the ponderomotive energy is here lower, right? So uh, the redshift in the very center is larger than it is here. Yeah? Um, and this amounts to, um, well, uh, incoherent sum of all these ATI spectra due to the different intensities here in the focus. And therefore, this creates a, a broadening of the, um, of the ATI peaks. Yeah? So um, if the pulses are short enough, to suppress um, gaining UP in the focus, um, the observed ATI spectrum ATI spectrum will be the, of course, incoherent sum of spectra created by the different intensities. Yeah. They are redshifted um, by different amounts according to the local intensity. Amounts UP of X according to the local intensity, yeah, I of x. Yeah, and what we then get is we expect broadened uh, broadened ATI peaks. And if the intensity is sufficiently high, then of course, this shift can be so large, can be larger than the distance between ATI peaks, and then you lose the ATI, spec, uh, the ATI peaks. Yeah? Then you use the ATI peak structure. Yeah? So if UP is larger H bar omega, well, and the details, yeah, uh, of course, you need um, regions where uh, intensity is high enough, um, yeah, but just roughly speaking here. Yeah, so you need uh, int intensities with different product of ionization energy, uh, of ionization probability and volume, yeah, so um, um, focal volume. Yeah, so if this, pro uh, if this product is uh, yeah, so if you have two intensities that differ um, such uh, that uh, UP differs by H bar omega and uh, you still um, have uh, enough uh, uh, ionization yield from, from both uh, uh, volumes, from both intensities, um, then um, 
then the ATI peak structure is lost. Yeah. You frequently find in the literature the statement that when the ATI peak structure is lost, that this is an indication of tunnel ionization. Yeah? So you find this very often in older literature. I think you still find it in modern literature. This is just wrong. Yeah? So this, uh, we'll see that uh, with, uh, with tunneling, uh, this, uh, yeah, so there's no reason to think that tunneling creates no ATI peak structure. This is an entirely uh, wrong picture of, uh, of ATI. And when we discuss interference effects, um, st starting with uh, the next lecture, um, you'll see in more detail what I mean by that. Okay, um, a final effect in in, uh, in ATI spectra due to the ponderomotive shift. These are the so-called Freeman resonances. Yeah. Uh, ah, so, you are, uh, so the question is uh, whether there is an effect of the Goy phase here. No, there is not. Because uh, the electrons, so we have the incoherent sum of these electrons, right? Um, it, well, yeah, to a certain sense there would be, so if the, uh, if the pulse would be very short, right? Um, then, of course, uh, we would have a transition from, say, sine-like pulses to cosine-like pulses to minus sine-like pulses. Right? And these uh, spectra, they would, um, uh, they would uh, look somewhat different. Uh, but actually, the, um, uh, the effect of, um, of the absolute phase on uh, the spectra would be much stronger than, um, uh, than effect, uh, effects of averaging. Yeah? So, um, yeah, so the Goy phase is, um, well, I wouldn't say it, it doesn't play a role. Yeah, so if you want to if you want to study ATI peaks with very short pulses, then you would um, then you would try to switch off the Goy phase, yeah, and you would uh, do this by placing say um, a pinhole here. Right. So you would place a pinhole here, say, or a slit here, yeah, so that just electrons from a certain region can reach your detector. Yeah? Okay, well, the Freeman resonances. So, the following um, experimental evidence. The experimental evidence. Famous paper, uh, 600, uh, 60 citations I saw uh, today. Um, and uh, what, um, what Rick Freeman, uh, yeah, so it was a, um, 35 years ago or so, um, what Rick Freeman observed was that uh, as the pulse duration is decreased, yeah, and um, ah, well, the intensity also uh, was increased accordingly, um, these ATI peaks, they broke up, uh, up in uh, many sub-peaks, right? And when they looked uh, in more detail into it, they realized um, that in some sense, this uh, fine structure of the ATI peaks reflects the, um, uh, the, the excited states, right? And, uh, well, if you think about it again, um, then it's actually quite clear what happens. Yeah, so we said that the, that the um, ionization threshold essentially is moved to higher energies, is shifted to higher energies because of the ponderomotive energy, right? Yeah, so we said that um, an electron sitting at, um, 
just uh, having, yeah, so just that the ionization threshold is a free electron, and therefore, um, uh, and therefore you can think about the ionization threshold being shifted upwards. Yeah, so this would be just different language. Now, if you have an excited state that is just below the ionization threshold, then an electron sitting there is almost free. Yeah, so it would have almost the Pondromotive energy. Yeah, so an electron in a Rydberg state is, well, you, can, you cannot really distinguish it from that perspective from a free electron. Yeah, so this means that not only the, uh, the ionization threshold is shifted by the Pondromotive energy, but together with that also the um, um, also the um, the excited states. Yeah, so um, here uh, is a picture for that. Well, actually, I should have discussed something before. Uh, when I see this picture, it just crosses my mind um, that we should introduce another chapter here before. Yeah, so I call that 6.3. And, uh, and this one here is 6.2, channel closing. Channel closing. This happens. This happens if um, at say zero intensity you would have six photon ionization and now uh, when you increase say yeah so just an example uh, say situation is such that uh, at zero intensity you have six photon ionization but now you increase the uh, intensity and suddenly you realize that i need seven photons in order to subdue not only the ionization threshold but also uh, to provide the pondromotive energy right this means that the lowest ATI peak is, is killed, yeah, is eaten up by the increasing uh, Pondromotive energy. Yeah? So, um, if the, um, if UP is so large, Uh, and uh, yeah, so even one photon energy uh, would be enough, um, is so large that um, instead of n photons, being um, sufficient um, for n times h bar omega larger than eip yeah, so meaning sufficient for ionization like that. Um, one needs n plus one photons to realize um, n plus one times h bar omega larger than eip plus up um, the lowest order peak lowest order peak will disappear. 
Yeah, because it shifted, because it is shifted to e equals zero. Yeah? Yeah, and this is called channel closing, and actually this is depicted here. Yeah, so you see that um, with increasing intensity, yeah, um, the, um, the effective ionization threshold shifts like this, right? And uh, here um, I had one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, so five photons were here sufficient in order to, uh, in order to subdue the ionization, the effective ionization threshold. And here at this intensity, yeah, so the first ATI peak is shifted to zero energy. And here it is below, so I need one photon more. So now back to what I wanted to explain before. Yeah, so um, I said that the ionization threshold shifts up like this. But of course, there are excited states below that. Yeah, so say Rydberg states like that. Uh, and they are almost free, and therefore they shift pretty much in the same way as the Pondre mode shift. So from quantum mechanics, you may actually know the concept of AC Stark shifts or light shifts. What we are considering here is the AC Stark or light shift of, um, of highly excited um, 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 states, right? Um, and of course, they can be uh, their light shift can be um, derived classically. Yeah. So, and what you see is that at some points, for example, at this point, ionization can be resonantly enhanced. Yeah. And this is actually what we see here, right? Um, so. Um, when ponderomotively shifted excited states become resonant, um, ionization, multiphoton ionization is strongly enhanced. Yeah, so um, resonantly enhanced multiphoton ionization is actually a powerful technique um, for physical chemistry. Yeah, so for learning something about uh, the structure um, of molecules. This is kind of what we see here. Right? Um, I think time is up. Um, but um, yeah, so the way it was initially explained it was just uh, like this. Yeah? So uh, once the, um, the laser, so let's draw it time dependent. Yeah, so the original idea had been this one here. Yeah, so once, um, yeah, so what we have here now is time. And what you see here is the time dependent ionization threshold. Yeah, it follows, of course, um, um, the intensity of the pulse. Yeah? So the time-dependent intensity of the pulse. And so do these excited, state, excited states. Yeah? And the original idea put forward in, uh, in Freeman's paper uh, had been once we cross this, yeah, so we see a strong enhancement, yeah? instantaneous enhancement. Yeah. Um, later, um, other authors, um, Harmgard Miller in, uh, in the Netherlands, he pointed out that it can also be the case that we just populate the excited state there and use the rest of the pulse in order to ionize out of that. And you see that this, both scenarios can't be distinguished from each other. Yeah, so you see that the surplus here is always the same. Yeah, because excited states and ionization threshold 
they shift in parallel. Okay, with this, um, I used more time than uh, available, actually. I thank you for your patience, and uh, see you next time.